so good afternoon. It seems that I have to be to remain seated. Uh, I used normally used to to walk around, so uncomfort uncomfortable. Um, I'm going to take you to Flanders. Um, I noticed in the program book that I forgot a word in my title that was in Flanders. So the story I'm going to tell you deals with Belgium. So Flanders is a Dutch-speaking part of uh, Belgium, uh, but it's a problem that we notice that goes beyond the borders of Flanders and Belgium. The direct cause of this presentation was the increase of the findings of bodies of soldiers, fallen soldiers, especially of the First World War on the Western Front, and also the lack of a decent of decent guidelines that helped us how to deal with those bodies, with those findings. So maybe I give you a short, short introduction in the First World War for those who are not um, comfortable with it. So this is uh, the Western Front uh, over here. Point is, this is Paris, this is Belgium. And so my story deals about this small part of the Western Front, the part that is situated in Flanders. The front in Flanders, you see a, a, a hill shade map, is uh, divided in two parts. You have a northern part, no, so this is a front, this is the, the Allied troops, uh, the D German troops that advanced towards the coast, and the Allied troops in 1914 that stopped the, the, the German advance. And so the front stopped in 1914 and changed into a trench war, into a static, quite static trench war, and lasted there for the next four years. So the front is divided into two parts. In the northern part, you have the inundation area. So the floodgates at Newport were opened and the, the complete plain was set under water. And the, the front desk uh, remained quite fairly, I wouldn't say peaceful, but quiet. In the southern part, you have the Ypres salient, in which one used the, the natural hills to defend Ypres. So Ypres, the city, is situ situated more or less over here. And it was surrounded by those hills, you see. And uh, the, the, the area of Ypres, the Ypres salient, was known as one of the most bloody uh, areas, battlefields in the First World War, together with the, the Somme Valley and Verdun. Um, it was known, for example, for the, the launch of the first gas attack in human his history in 1915. It was a chlor gas attack launched. This was also known for the, the Battle of Passchendaele. I don't know if this picture was really taken, taken in, in Ypres, but it was how the landscape looked after the, the, the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917. So the complete area was destroyed. This also implicates that there were quite a lot of uh, soldiers got killed in that war. Um, there were about um, 600,000 people got killed, soldiers got killed, and a few number of them are still miss missing. It's, it's, we don't have a real exact number, but you see it in the, the Menon Gate for the ones who have ever visited um, Aper. This is a gate with about 50,000 names of uh, missed soldiers from the Commonwealth. Uh, but in total, we estimated about 150,000 to 200,000 soldiers got missed and are somewhere hidden in the fields of, of the Flanders fields. Now the problem is that today Ypres is a dynamic uh, area with a living population, with industry and agriculture. One, one builds roads, one constructs pipelines, and on a regular basis, uh, fallen soldiers are found and recovered. For about 10 years, so this is uh, some, some numbers we collected from police and, and military authorities, um, average eight to ten bodies were found each year. So you see it on, on the left side, and this goes up to 2000. If you if you go further to the 90s, 80s, this remain about the same eight, six, eight, ten uh, bodies a year were found. Uh, but the last decade, we see a significant increase of the number. I, I think it's quite impressive. <laughs> um, there are some facts behind the numbers. We can we can explain them. Um, here, see them divided in two parts. You have in, in red, you see the accidental finds. So the bodies that were found uh, during uh, civil works and, and so on. Um, and then you see a quite, quite um, large uh, increase. Um, we don't know, in 2015, it was uh, the, the peak you see in 2015 was because it was uh, found a mass grave of German soldiers. So that makes a bit of a different uh, image. And in blue, you see the archaeological interest. So you see, before 2000, there was almost no excavation of humans, of, of human bodies, no excavation of First World War, and no 
archaeological re re registration of human bodies. But then, from about 2005, 2007, there was a large increase. Um, the, the two peaks you see is on, on one hand, you see the construction of a, a large gas line through the front in 2014, 2015, in which uh, I think about 20, 30 uh, bodies were found. And the last of 2018, but 2018 is a real strange year. Uh, it's especially the project of Hill 80, maybe you heard about it. It's a crowdfunding project in which uh, four mass graves of German soldiers were found, about uh, 120 uh, bodies. So that changed the images. Uh, we Luckily, we don't have such a, an excavation land every year. Um, now, um, if you see the accidental finds, the increase of the ex accidental finds, is we cannot conclude that more bodies are found because uh, one is not more building or constructing, constructing. But we notice that findings of bodies are more reported. And the reason for that increase is the raising of the awareness that are skeletons, skeletons of soldiers, that they have a value, they have an identity, sometimes a name. And the awareness of that, that a skeleton can have a value, is linked directly to, first of all, the archaeological interest in the First World War, but also indi indirectly to the commemoration of the 100 years uh, First World War. That's, this led us to the need of, a, of some guidelines, because um, before a few years, uh, if someone found a body, it was completely unknown, even at police offices, how to, how to act. Um, it was, there was a lack of a clear guideline. Um, so, so people, uh, police, military officers, and things like that, they didn't know how to act, what to do when someone, someone reported um, um, finding of a dead body. And therefore, our agency, the Flanders Heritage Agency, uh, went into dialogue with uh, police, with military authorities uh, from Belgium as well as uh, foreign nation states and also with a public prosecutor. And this resulted in a guideline which I'd like to present to you. Uh, first discussion po point, uh, a body of a dead soldier of the First World War, but also the Second World War. Is this archaeology or is this a military uh, issue? There are for both arguments. Um, first of all, there's a Convention of Geneva. You can read it yourself. The Convention of Geneva describes how to deal with the bodies of dead soldiers of recent conflicts. So in this point of view, it's very undoubtedly that they belong to the, that's the military issue. So that the military authorities can decide whether to excavate, to repatriate, to leave them. It's, an, in fact, a military decision. But on the other hand, there was also a court of Ypres um, who decided to set in 2006 they declared that objects and structures from the First World War can have an archaeological value, and so that the archaeological legacy is counting also for objects and structures from the First World War, there's also for dead bodies. Is this a conflict? No, we don't believe so. We finally concluded that a body of a fallen, fallen soldier can be both military as archaeological. So the Geneva Convention does not exclude that a body is excavated by archaeologists using archaeological methods. So this led us, leads us to the base of our guideline. Archaeologists always have to be involved in the excavation or the recovery of a fallen soldier, and they have to care a decent uh, and, and take care of a decent and qualitative excavation of the body, because a qualitative, qualitative excavation can deliver details that can lead to identification, but also about the circumstances in which he got killed details about the battle, personal life, and warfare in general. That information won't change our large picture of the First World War, or even of the Second World War, it's also accounting for the Second World War, but it can highlight, highlight unknown details that are hardly unknown, unknown by other forces, sources. The guideline distinguishes two different processes. First of all, we put the spots on the accidental finds. In those cases, and that's counting for every excavation effect. If, a human, if human remains are, remains are found, it's always the police that is be the first that must be alerted. And the reason for that is that they have to exclude that it's not a crime scene or a recent, uh, a recent crime. Um, 
in case of a possible crime scene, this is up to the police to, to alert the public prosecutor and then they take over. In case of it's the conclusion that it's, it's, it seems to be a body of a fallen soldier, the police is contacted, contacting our services uh, as well as the military authorities, Belgian military authorities. And then um, our archaeologists, assisted by um, physical anthropo anthropologists, carry out the excavations. Afterwards, we have 30 days to study the bones and the associated, associated objects. Um, and after that period, after those 30 days, we handle over the, the body and the associated objects to the military authorities. And they handle it over again to the nation state. And then it's up to the nation state to decide whether they go further with, um, for example, DNA with historical research or even contacting family, uh, family and things like that. If a body is found during archaeological research, and you notice that this happens quite often, um, it's always, always again, the police that is uh, the first to be contacted. In practice, is the police then at that moment, they ask advice to the archaeological, archaeologist, ar archaeologist on the field whether this, this is a soldier or not. It seems quite logical. And here again, if it seems to be soldiers, it's uh, also the military authorities are alerted. Uh, but it's, then it is up to the archaeologists to take the excavation to, 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 uh, to take the initiative in the field and to carry out the excavation. In case uh, of an excavation, uh, it happens very often that uh, we, for example, this is an excavation from trenches in, in Ypres, that during the, the trial trenches, we did not know that there were hidden, there were fallen soldiers, but during the excavations, some bodies are recovered. Then again, police is alerted, and then on the suspicion of the military authorities, uh, the archaeologists can just uh, carry out the excavations. There are two important details, um, funding. Um, in Belgium and in Flanders, the Malta, Malta Convention is uh, implemented into re regional uh, legacy, including some articles about financing. This implicates that the developer has to pay the bill of the excavations in general, but in particular, also the, the excavation of the bodies of fallen soldiers. And uh, we're a bit surprised that even the nation state or the mili military authorities don't make any problem of that. So they fully agree that during excavation, when the archaeologist that is carry out the excavation is also excavating the body, that is the developer who pays the bill. Secondly, is, is the press and our contact, the, the way that the, 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 the finding of, of bodies is shown in the press. Maybe you've noticed that I did not use pictures of details of pictures of bodies. And that is because it deals with soldiers, with an identity. And we agreed with the military authorities that details of fallen soldiers are not shown in the press. Sometimes it's difficult, it happens very often that, for example, an accidental find that is along the road, someone comes and takes a picture with a smartphone and puts it on, on Facebook. That's quite a problem. We try to avoid it as maximum as possible. So we agreed, don't show pictures of dead bodies, details in, in, in the press. Let me conclude. Although the guideline was published just a few weeks ago, we implemented this way of working for a few years now, so we have some trial. With some significant results, more findings of fallen soldiers, a better consciousness in the pro broad public, and especially a fertile collaboration between the different archaeologists on the one hand and police and military authorities on the other hand.